it gives me great pleasure today to welcome you to the fall 2014 honors lecture series on the power of place. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College here at Middle Tennessee State University. Our speaker today is Dr. Preston McDougall, who is one of our most dedicated uh, and long-serving uh, members of the honors faculty here at MTSU. He's professor of chemistry and an active member of the honors faculty. He's been teaching honors general chemistry, both uh, lecture and lab, since the fall semester of 1999. He also advises honor students who do research in computational and theoretical chemistry. Dr. McDougal came to MTSU in 1994 following a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He received his Bachelor of Science the honors and PhD degrees in chemistry from McMaster University in Canada, where he worked with the late R.F.W. Batter and contributed fundamentally to the development of the quantum theory of atoms and molecules. His current research, which has applications in drug design and nanotechnology, has been shared with chemists in important places such as Aula Avogardo or Avogardo Hall in Turin, Italy. So today we welcome Dr. McDougall, whose paper, his presentation is entitled The Importance of Place in Chemistry. Now you see it, now you don't. Well, it's good to, be, good to be back in the Honors College building and uh, the Honors seminar series. I believe this is my third seminar uh, in this series. Always very enjoyable. So I'm going to talk about the importance of place in chemistry. Now you see it. Now you don't. Um, I'll explain the reason for that. Uh, first is um, when I was initially, Dr. Phillips asked me to give a talk. He gave me the title of the importance of place in chemistry. I had a knee-jerk reaction, and jerk is on my part, that, well, there's no importance place in chemistry, um, but um, thought about it, and uh, I think there's something interesting I can say about the importance of place in chemistry. We'll see if you agree with me. Um, I wanted to emphasize that the physical chemical laws that govern the, um, the chemical processes that occur, why one atom reacts with another atom, or one molecule reacts with another, mo another molecule, are universal, uh, as far as we know. Uh, but one reaction May, the forces or the, the laws may dictate one outcome, but in an environment, if, if, that may determine the, the course of the outcome or the amounts of products that are determined. So environments do change. Even though the, the laws themselves don't change, the environments that chemical processes do occur and do change. So we might see some, some effect there. And uh, environments can vary greatly. Um, and we'll see sometimes, you might think the environment is very different, but it's actually not very different. And we're going to talk about chemistry is universal, so we're going to talk about the whole universe. We can talk about the whole universe. And we'll see this, there are scales that chemists are interested in that truly have dizzying ranges, you know, from galactic to subatomic. Um, so it's, if you think about powers of 10, that's a lot of powers of 10. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, some tools that if you want to study the importance of, if you want to not just learn about, learn about it, but you actually want to study the importance of place in chemistry, then there are some tools that you can use to, to explore some aspects of that. And some of them were developed right here uh, at MTSU. And so this will be maybe more interest to science majors than the, uh, the English majors, but bear with me, it's not going to be too technical, please. So place depends on context. So the chemistry of the elements depends on their place in the periodic table, of course. Uh, so you've, everybody, has, everybody has seen the periodic table in, in school. Uh, so you know about uh, different elements um, have different properties. We breathe oxygen. We don't breathe sodium. So the chemistry of the elements obviously depends on their place in the periodic table. Everybody knows that. And, and of course, you can also see that place is important in the periodic table. Germanium is named after place, called Germany. Gallium is named after place. French name for, or the, the Latin name for France is uh, gallium or gallia. I have to ask a Latin uh, scholar. So, and there's other, other, other references as well. Iterbium, erbium, 
And uh, several, several, several of these elements on the bottom part of the periodic table here are named after a small town in Sweden. I think there's three elements named after the same village in Sweden. Of course, California, Californium, right there, CF, Americium, named after where we are right now. So, and I also want to put in a plug for my nomination for this element. 118 has been discovered. I think they've made a couple dozen atoms, but they do know it exists, and it's been confirmed by multiple groups, but not, made, not, very, not, been, uh, not been named yet. That's why it has this uno, uno, uno octum, something like that. It's a Latin name for 118. And, um, but I am I'm getting my students and, and friends to write their politicians, their, their senators, and anybody else I think has, has clout to name this Tennesseeum. Um, there's, there's some momentum for this. P Professor Vanderbilt is actually in, uh, on board with this and, uh, some, and it's growing. So Tennesseeum obviously would be to recognize the great contributions that are made to the chemistry of these very heavy elements at Oak Ridge. None of them were discovered in Tennessee, um, but people, chemists and physicists at Oak Ridge have done uh, really the lion's work of determining the chemical properties of these very, very rare and short-lived elements. So certainly be uh, justified to name that element 118 at, as Tennesseeum. So I'd like to see that. So the chemistry of the elements depends entirely on their place on the periodic table. Or does it? Um, can anybody see the change? Look, these two periodic tables, this one, previous one and this one, look very similar. Does anybody see the difference? I can go back. If you don't have photographic memory. Anybody? Um, See it? The second one has a green L, 118. It has, what does it have? The second one has, oh. Uh, no, 118 is uno uno octum still. The third column, well, you're, you're on the right track, yep. So the third column, you see there's lanthanum and actinium are in the third column here, right here, they're down here. So they change place. Lacti lanthium and actinium were in this, what we call, the chemist called the D block, and what, the previous one, but they're down here in the F block. So they change place. And believe me, some chemists get really upset about that. Um, they, they have letter writing campaigns saying that's, how could you do that, the chemistry, of, of lanthanum and actinium belong with the other so-called F groups, and they do. Uh, they don't belong here. So the other periodic table had them in the wrong place um, to a chemist. And of course, some chemists put them in all different places. This is uh, uh, Theodore Benfi's so-called spiral periodic table, which uh, you can start with, with hydrogen, helium, and sort of a spiral. I call the, think of it as a labyrinth. This is actually has some, some meaning and some uh, rational, r str some good rationality to it. So again, now the, pr the place before has completely different meaning place here. But that was it. Now what Dr. Phillips meant, I'm sure, by place. He referred, to, he was referring to place, actual places, not, not abstract places. I think, but place can mean different things, different contexts. Okay, so real place, actual uh, three-dimensional places. The chemistry, as I said, the chemistry of the elements does not depend on their place in the universe. So we are here. This is the Milky Way galaxy, and we are right here um, on this, this spiral branch of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, um, it's presumed that the center of our galaxy, there's a black hole. We do not, the chemistry may be very different at the black hole. We've never, we've never done any experiments um, or any measurements of, of atoms, observed atoms, in a black hole. So the chemistry, what I say is universal, does not depend, it, there, there may be exceptions. I may have to correct this if we ever get sucked into a black hole and my chemistry labs don't work anymore. Um, so with that exception, that, that may be different in a black hole, chemistry, the laws of chemistry are the same everywhere in the universe. And we, we know that because, um, well, we've done experiments on Earth, right in here somewhere, and we've taken, sent robots to places like Mars, but robots on, <clears throat> on satellites that have gone in outside of the solar system. And we've measured properties. These, these, these satellites have instruments on them, chemical instruments. And we're able to do measurements in the lab on, su on chemical substances and then compare those to measurements that are done on Mars or other planets, Venus, and, and confirm that the, that the measurements are the same. Now, the, ke the chemicals that are there are a little bit different than the chemicals on Earth, but that's because the environments are different. But the, the experiments that we do on Earth are applicable and can, 
can be calibrated with the experiments done on, on other places that we've, that we've explored so far. And as far as sending robots, we haven't gone very far. We've just basically, um, Voyager just left the solar system just in the last year or so, depending on what you define the, as the limit of the solar system. <clears throat> but chemists can look, we can use our telescopes, astrochemists can look far away into other galaxies and, in, and interstellar space and, and other galaxies. And we can measure fingerprints of atoms, the light that they send us, um, we can learn about, we can compare those to measurements in the lab. And we've identified chemical species like amino acids that are in our bodies. We've seen them in space because of, because of comparing their, their measured spectra. So we, we're, we're, very, we're very certain that the chemistry elements does not depend on their place in the universe. <clears throat> I think everybody knows who this is. Um, this is not Walter White. Uh, this is not Dr. White. Dr. White is actually a professor of chemistry in our department. He's the, Dr. Gary White is the professor, is the coordinator of general chemistry at MTSU. This is a, a cartoon of, of Walter White that goes by Heisenberg. And this is, the, uh, this is what's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. So what this says is delta x, this, this means the uncertainty in the position or place. This means the uncertainty in the momentum. And it's greater than or equal to Planck's constant over, th this is a very small number, but quantum mechanics says that this must be greater than this number. It must be. There's no, there's no way around it. It's a limitation of quantum mechanics. So this means, and this cartoon is sort of illustrating that, if you know the, and this, this delta again, it means uncertainty. So it's, if you know the momentum, let's say you know it exactly, that means the uncertainty is zero. Well, that means that the uncertainty in position is infinite. So if you don't know where you are, there's infinite uncertainty, then position has no, no, no meaning at all. That's what I mean by this. So sometimes place doesn't have a definite meaning to a chemist. And it's because of the uncertainty in the position that is dictated by quantum theory. Now, for atoms, for atoms, this uncertainty position is usually very, very small. We can be, under almost all circumstances, we can be certain that an atom is in a particular molecule. Uh, but for electrons and other, other uh, subatomic particles, that uncertainty uh, can be very larger than a molecule even. Um, but for hydrogen, hydrogen is very important. That uncertainty position can be significant. So we can actually, for, talking about hydrogen, we can actually have some uncertainty in its place, its position. <clears throat> All right, an example of the universality of chemistry. For instance, this is a photograph taken in Antarctica. Um, this is a meteorite, um, just landed. People are walking. They, there's a every time, a certain time of year when it's summer there, so it's not not terrible conditions, but it's warm enough to to live and sleep at night. Uh, scientists walk and scan these these fields, these plains, ice plains, for what are clearly meteorites, things that have fallen from the sky, and uh, they take them back to the lab. Now, we know this is from Mars, and how do we? You might say, well, how do you know it's from Mars? You know, there's no sign on it that says, you know, made in Mars. Um, so the way they know it's made in Mars is uh, they take it back to a, a la chemistry laboratory and they look at its chemical, chemical composition. And one of, the, one of the key observations, when they cut these open, meteorites are generally formed by solidifying liquid. Um, uh, some, some big explosion happens. The, rock, the rocks get melted by the impact of the explosion and they and they, they, after they fly into the air, they cool again. And when, the, when the, the lava or the melted rock cools, it traps some of the air that it was on when it got hit by whatever caused it to leave its home planet. Well, the air that's trapped, the chemists can, there's little bubbles. So they cut it and they actually capture the tiny little bubbles of atmosphere that are in these meteorites and they look at the composition. How much argon is in it, how much helium, how much hydrogen, how much oxygen. And they know, um, by, particularly by the amount of helium, heli helium has two isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4. Helium, as you know, if you ever had a balloon in your kid, is a very light element, okay? You let a helium balloon go, and you started crying because you never got it back. It went up, and uh, it, ac it actually ended up leaving Earth's atmosphere. Because helium is so light that eventually it will, the balloon will pop, um, and the helium atoms are so light that they actually leave the Earth's atmosphere. That's because Earth's gravity is so low that it can't, it can't, it can't, it can't hold down the, the motion of, of very, very light atoms. That's why you have to be careful. If you have a radon detector, you put it in the basement because radon is very heavy. It's at the very bottom right above what might be Tennessee on the periodic table. It's very heavy. So radon atoms go, go down and they accumulate in your basement if you have a lot of 
uranium in the, the rocks that built the bricks in your house. So um, heavy, heavy gases, even though they're gases, they fall down. Light gases, they go up, and uh, depending on the, on the force of gravity. So the force of gravity is different on Earth than it is on the moon. That's why the astronauts could you know, jump around, because gravity on the moon is one-sixth of gravity on Earth. Gravity on Mars is about one-third, about one-third. I forget exactly, but it's a little less than a half So compared to Earth. So the amount of the, that, that affects how much helium will remain in the, in the Martian atmosphere compared to Earth's atmosphere on average. And so that's how they actually know. They compare the amount of helium that is in the bubbles. They know that it was not Earth, and it was mo most likely Mars. And they look at other pieces involving uranium and other uranium and thorium and other elements. And they basically get, when they get enough evidence together, that they can be 99.99% certain that this came from Mars. And of course, the job of so other scientists is to, to look at the data and, and try and disprove that hypothesis. But so far, there's enough data, particularly helium data, that can confirm that this rock, in fact, came from Mars, even though there's no tag on it. All right, everybody knows what th recognizes this is the International Space Station. Um, this is to start with a wide angle lens because it looks like it's very far above Earth. The International Space Station is actually not that far above Earth. I think it's about 180 miles at the most. So it's closer than Memphis, actually. When it, when it, when it goes over, to, over, over Nashville, the International Space Station is closer than Memphis. Um, but you've seen the pictures. It looks like everybody is, was, is weightless. They, they, and they, a lot of, they used to say, they've corrected themselves now, but they used to say that it's zero G, it's zero gravity. Well, if you've taken physical science in high school, you can count using Newton's universal law of gravitation, which is over 300 years old, you can calculate the gravity of the space station is about 92% what it is right now, what you're feeling right now. They're floating because they're actually falling. The space station is falling towards Earth at the same time that it's orbiting Earth. So it's just like being in an elevator. If you were in an elevator and the cable broke, you would be weightless for about two and a half seconds. Then you'd be dead. But um, <laughs> at the, the, during that two, sec two and a half seconds you're weightless, you would be experiencing exactly what they're feeling uh, on the space station. So you're just falling, but you're falling at the same rate that the space station is. So um, you think you're weightless. Uh, so it's not zero. They call it micro G because it's, there's, uh, there's very little vibrations and there's, there's very little um, forces. So the, yes, the molecules are experiencing slight, l less forces, but that has very little effect on the chemistry. Uh, as This is a quote right here. Tamiflu, which was uh, in the news when we had bird flu, um, now we have Ebola. We haven't, got a, we haven't got drugs to treat Ebola yet, but chemists and biochemists are working on it. But when bird flu was a big thing, Tamiflu was, was all the news. Everybody was stocking up on Tamiflu. Well, Tamiflu was uh, a drug that was designed based on a crystal of an enzyme that is essential for, um, for, for flu virus. Uh, so if you could attack that, you could, you could, say, cure the flu. So this is a person, Graham Lever, a drug designer, that wrote a book about uh, his, his experiences curing, curing the flu. It was a big, big news event when NASA wanted to justify spending billions of dollars on the space station that they said we can cure drugs because you can grow crystals in space that are far, far better than crystals that can be grown on Earth because there's zero G. This is what they said on the space station. Well, they said, and they gave the example that Tamiflu was, was d discovered based on using the crystals grown in the space station. Well, it turns out Tamiflu was not. It was Space crystals grown in Australia, which is weird, but it's not in space. Um, so, uh, you th well, they were, well, they did. They did do there. Some some of the crystals, some of the crystals can be grown a little bit better, but it's not. It's not a huge difference. Not, not significant. You would think that this environment is very very different from our chemistry building. But it turns out it's not. I mean, just, it looks very, like very different, but it turns out it's not very, very different. For some things, like if you're burning, if you're burning gases, uh, a Bunsen burner does not work in the space station because Bunsen burner relies on rising gases. And that's because of, that's because of, uh, of, 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 of gravity and, and um, heavy gases falling, whereas light gases are rising right now. Uh, but it doesn't happen in the space station. So, a uh, Bunsen burner actually looks kind of cool in, in space. It's, it's like a little ball rather than the candle-like shape you see now. So some things are different involving uh, um, flues, flues of gases, but 
not things in solution like crystals, not so much. And um, place is very important, um, atomic place in a molecule. So here is a, th here is a steroid skeleton, ske steroid skeleton. Almost all, all steroids have this basic structure. And on, on top of these, you add other elements. So boys have at certain atoms some places, girls have certain atoms certain places. That's the pink, blue and pink, okay? But you see, the, 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 this little diagram is how organic chemists draw the structure. And the, the lines are connecting carbon atoms. And R is something that's stuck on the carbon atoms. So you see, each carbon atom has an address. It's like its place on this, this sort of series of connected cul-de-sacs, you, you could call them. So the different address. And what you, what you put, oxygen on carbon-3 or OH on carbon-3, makes a big difference to biology. Huge difference to biology. This is, this is what chemistry is all about, you know, changing the positions of atoms on molecules um, to make them different or finding out what the positions are in molecules that, that exist in nature. We want to understand why they do certain things. We want to know where the atoms are. What's the place of, of the atoms in the molecule? So place within a molecule is fundamental to chemistry. And this is what got me when I started thinking this way, it became very interesting. Um, and that's what chemistry is all about. So I already mentioned that helium-3, helium-4 makes a big difference um, to what planet you're on, what gases are in the atmosphere. Um, well, speaking of testosterone, anybody recognize who that is? Who? Yeah, nope. It's, no, not Lance Armstrong. He's the guy that um, led to the downfall of Lance Armstrong. Anybody recognize this guy? Oh, his name is Floyd Landis. Floyd Landis won the Tour de France uh, after um, Lance Armstrong won like five or six. I think, maybe six, I think, Lance won. Uh, this guy, this guy won the seventh one, and um, it was suspicious because he was struggling on one day, and then the next day, he just, whoo, like he had a, uh, an, an engine on his bike. He just surged past everybody and took the, the, yellow, the yellow shirt. And uh, when he finished, th they, had, they, took a, they took a blood test and a urine test like they do all, all the bikers. And unfortunately, he had testosterone in his body, like all men do, and we saw the structure before. But chemists were able to weigh these molecules, one molecule at a time, and carbon-12, well, everybody's heard of carbon. Carbon comes in different isotopes. Um, and they're each a little bit heavier than the other. Carbon-12 is the lightest. Carbon-13 is a little bit heavier. Carbon-14 is a little heavier. Basically, 14, 12, 13, 14, about the weights of these atoms in what we call atomic units. Carbon-14 is actually radioactive. But carbon-12 and carbon-13, they're in all all of, our, all of our molecules, about 1% of the carbon atoms in our body um, are carbon-13s. And, uh, but in the molecules of testosterone, they, they, could, they could weigh them and they could, they could count the numbers of carbon-12s versus the numbers of carbon-13s in those molecules. And they should be a certain ratio, much less than one, uh, very small ratios, it's less than 4%, for any molecules that actually made in a man's body. But you can make testosterone based uh, starting with plant material in a chemistry laboratory. And when you do that, because of the way, plant, the way that plants make molecules versus the way that animals make molecules, uh, the reactions are different, the laws of chemistry are different, but the environment is different, so the products are different. Uh, there's a different ratio. So they, can, they, they could conclude, chemists could conclude, that the testosterone, most of the testosterone in his body was artificially synthesized and then ingested. And so he lost. He lost his, he lost his uh, Tour de France um, medal, and he then squealed on uh, Lance Armstrong. OK, so how do we study the importance uh, of place within, within a molecule? And um, uh, this, is a, this is a picture I, may, I found in a, in a chemical instrumentation magazine. And it's meant to sell a particle analyzer, but it has this Think density, and maybe you can see there's a person in there thinking very carefully. So um, think density. So density, everybody does familiar with density. Lead is a very dense element. Helium is not very dense. That's why it flies up and leaves the, the atmosphere eventually. So this is density. 
Okay, it's going to get a little bit technical, but don't worry, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt. This is the symbol chemists have for the electron density. So when you talk about density in school, you're talking about the mass density. In other words, how much mass is in a small volume? Well, the electron density is how many electrons are in the same volume. So where there's lots of electrons, it's a high density. Where there's a very little amount of electrons, it's a low density. It's just like mass, but it's, you're counting electrons, not, not mass units. Well, this is, and if you've taken any chemistry class, you might have heard the charge cloud. The charge cloud of atoms, we say it's always cloudy in the quantum world. That's because the, the electrons are in a cloud. So think of it as a cloud. You've seen clouds, they're wispy clouds, and they're dense thunderclouds. Okay, same idea. Cloud can be wispy or dense, but we can, we can measure it. Now, this is, what, this is how we measure it. We measure it with these kinds of instruments. And this is, this is the data, the symbol that we use for the data. This is a typical experiment. You have a crystal made of atoms, and the atoms have electrons. And then you have an x-ray tube. You shine it through uh, basically a lead to get a nice small, a small beam like this laser pointer. We don't have laser pointer. We don't have laser pointer X-rays yet, but we're working on it. You go through the crystal, and you can see maybe these little, this little pattern. It's a pattern of spots. Maybe you've seen the famous um, X pattern that Rosalind Franklin saw for DNA, and James Watson and Crick stole her data and got uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the double helix structure of DNA. It was Watts, It was Rosalind Franklin who actually did this, did this experiment, the same experiment. Um, and this is Tibor Korzanski. He's a professor of chemistry at MTSU. He's built one of these. Fantastic diffraction instruments at Oak Ridge. We don't have we don't have a three billion dollar neutron source at MTSU, which you need to diffract neutrons with to study st structures of proteins. Uh, so undergraduates can get involved with that. Honor students, if you have math, computer science, physics, chemistry, we can get involved with the research done at Oak Ridge. It's actually led by MTSU. Um, you can also calculate electron density. So this is measurement, measuring things. Ke scientists like to predict things. So this is, this, is, this is a symbol for quantum, quantum theory. Quantum theory allows you to predict the wave function and then the density. So this is at MTSU. Again, this is, you can't see it too well because it's dark. This is our 3D Viz lab. It's much better in the dark. So, uh, and these pictures are not fuzzy. Well, they, they're fuzzy to us. But when you put on the goggles, the 3D goggles, everything is very, very sharp in three dimensions. Um, this, is, this is the 3D Viz lab. This is what we call the 3D hyperwall. It's very useful for studying um, any kind of uh, chemical uh, system. And this is Dr. Anatoly Volkov. He helped me uh, build this so-called hyperwall. It is powered by a supercomputer we have right next door. There's a, there's a very powerful hyper, uh, uh, supercomputer next door that drives this, this, this computer. The important thing is we want to know the density. That's, where, that's what is real. That's what's measurable. Chemists often talk about orbitals. And some people in high school and college in organic chemistry, you hear about orbitals. Orbitals are important, but they're really just a model of this cloud that we're going to be talking about. OK, so once you, once you get this cloud, it's very, it looks like the cloud's outside. It's very, very boring. What are you going to do with it? Well, you can ask a Nobel laureate. OK, this is Sir Harry Croto. Harry Croto is won the Nobel Prize for proposing and eventually discovering buckyballs, C60. Um, um, and there's Harry Crow to give a talk at MTSU two weeks ago. He's talking to Sydney Smith, an honors chemistry student, talking about her research on uh, the importance of place in fatty acids, whether the fatty acids are cis or trans. And if you follow fatty acid uh, in, the, in the news, which is whether they're good for you or bad for you, so-called trans fats, that's what she's studying. And she's looking at the electron, the charge cloud, to try and understand why trans fats are so bad. But she's asking questions of Harry Croto. Uh, very, very nice gentleman, and uh, it's relevant to this because um, Harry Croto proposed looking for Buckminster Fullerene because he thought it was in space. He thought you could find this in space, and he was interested in looking for the spectrum of this molecule, the fingerprints, in space, and he, and he wanted to make it a lab so he could compare the, the spectrum of it on Earth so he could look for it in space. And uh, he found it in the lab, that's this guy's lab, Richard Smalley, and so that's what the Nobel Prize for finding this molecule. And then they, then they measured it and looked for its fingerprint. And they looked in space, and there it is. They found it. It's an abundant in, 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 uh, in faraway galaxies. So his dream was realized when they saw that. OK. If you had a little bit of calculus, you, know, you can use calculus to study the forms of, of functions. So this is just a function meant to look like an atomic function. 
Near the nucleus of an atom, there's a lot, this is the density of the cloud. So this curve, this line represents the density of the cloud. The, the, the nuclei, uh, nuclei are positive, electrons are negative. So a lot of the electrons trying to get near the nucleus, but not all of them. There's a, there's a tail. Some electrons are far away. But we can calculate this curve very accurately. And then we use calculus just to find the lumps and the holes. The little wiggles in that is what we're, we're going to look at. And, uh, well, I'll talk about it better. The next slide is better. Okay, so this is, this is an argon atom. This is what the cloud looks like. Again, this is, atoms are three-dimensional. I take a slice through an argon, an argon atom. I slice it, and I plot, the, I plot the density in that slice in the vertical axis. So near the nucleus, you see it goes up very high. It would go, it would go way past the top of the bell tower. Uh, so we cut it off so you can see that the cloud is very dense near the nucleus, but it falls off. And it looks like it's just pretty boring, just like a smoothly falling off. But when you use this tactile sensor, calculus, the second derivative, you can see that this function really has lots of, ripple, lots of, lots of lumps and holes, lots of ripples, ripples on it. And this is what it looks like. This is just bell squared rho. That's just the second derivative from calculus called the Laplacian in three dimensions of that function. So if you know argon, back to the periodic table, argon was in the third row. Helium was in the first row, then neon, and then argon. You see their shell. There's one, two, three shells. So just like you learn in science class that atoms have shells, the, the electron, the charge cloud, if you feel it with this tactile sensor, you see there are three shells of lumpiness uh, in, in the electrons. And you can go on to other, that's, a, that's an atom. For water molecule, this is water molecule, uh, this is, this is the oxygen atom, two hydrogens. Okay, so that's the plane containing all three atoms of the water molecule. That's the charge, that's the density. Again, it looks pretty boring. Just peaks or the nuclei are. But when you take the second derivative, you, again, you just, you're looking at the lumps and the holes, you see that oxygen has two shells, because oxygen is the second row of the periodic table, so the very beginning. Hydrogen does not. Hydrogen only has one peak, because hydrogen is the first row. So there's no, there's no quantum shells. So oxygen has two shells. And this is oxygen as well, and it has one, there's peaks. So the second shell has, has ripples within the shell. And so there's one, two, three, four. There's four peaks on the second shell of oxygen, which if you've ever taken freshman chemistry, you learn about the Lewis dot diagrams. You learn how to draw dot diagrams. And if you haven't taken chemistry, trust me, any, any freshman chemistry student, hopefully, coming up, the test coming up, they'll be able to draw that structure for water, and it agrees. So the cloud tells us what chemists, uh, um, what chemists intuitively believe these molecules look like. So we can go, that, the previous diagram was two-dimensional. It's a plane, right? It's a, it's a plane. I took a slice, two-dimensional slice. Just like this is a two-dimensional surface. These, th there's two-dimensional surface, and I plot the function, the cloud density in the third dimension. Well, if you want to look at molecules in three dimensions, you have to see the molecule. This is not, not another molecule, but you see all three dimensions. You see some of, the, some, of the, some of the atoms coming towards you. So the molecule is now shown in three dimensions, but I can't show, I can only show the density at one value. Because we can't think, we can't see in four dimensions. You can't, I can't, nobody can. So if we want, this is, these are where the atoms are. If you wanted to show the density at any point in the three-dimensional three space, We'll out of a fourth dimension. So we have to choose one value of the cloud. See, before we had the value of the cloud or the Laplacian changes. As you go up, the value changes. As you go down, the value, cha value changes. What you have to do is you have to choose one value. Let's say minus 10 and then, and then plot it. That's what, the, that's, what this, that's what the minus 10 contour looks like. Think, if you're looking at a, at a map, you have the contour lines. A topographic map, you have a contour line. Those contour lines represent one elevation. So you walk along the lines, you're staying the same elevation. So this is sort of representing, this surface represents one contour, one elevation. Well, it's no good because molecules are really three-dimensional. So I invented, I went to NASA and I invented this tool. This tool allows us to, using, like to play computer games, slide these sliders, sliders back and forth. And this is, a, this is adenine, the A and, G, a and DNA. Different, you can see how you can sort of see through this. It becomes sort of translucent. So this is what we call, uh, this is what we call the opacity transfer function. But this, this is called volume rendering. This started in computer graphics departments, uh, department at Stanford University. And this is the first application in science, in, in, in chemical or physical science. 
So you can sort of see through it, whereas before you, you couldn't see through it. You had these surfaces, you could see the surface, and then you couldn't tell what's inside. And you can't tell what's outside that surface. You're only seeing one. This is really a two-dimensional map, a curved two-dimensional map. So, but this is truly three-dimensional. We're able to see inside, inside, and by sliding this, it's like, like moving through a cell when you're in a, in a microscope. You can see different organelles in the cell by changing the focal plane. So we're able to see all th molecules in their 3D glory, I would say. So um, this is actually, um, um, quote, Lewis talking about Robert Boyle. Anybody know when Robert Boyle was active in, in, in science? Boyle's Law, yeah. Do you have any idea what century that was? Boyle's Law is correct, so you get a prize. Um, Boyle's Law is 1661, so 17th century. He, um, his, his, his experiments led to Newton um, thinking more quantitatively about, about physics. But this is Boyle's Law. Boyle so it's, so it's the same guy. Boyle was cr and his contemporaries were ridiculing another scientist nobody's heard of because they thought he was crazy. Yet he was saying that, that chemistry was one, sh uh, uh, suppose that particles of one are sharp and those of others are porous, and a chemical combination was affected by the fitting of points into the holes, lumps into the holes. So if we go back to this picture here, these are the lumps. Remember the Laplacian is showing where the lumps are. So this is the lump on a carbon atom. You see the little, this is a chromium atom, you see the, the little holes there. So lumps are in fact fitting into holes. So Lemery 350 years ago was not so crazy. So um, medicinal molecules affect how we feel, but what do they feel like? Remember, this tool is basically telling us where are the lumps in the holes. The, think of a blind person. A blind person reads Braille by the lumps in the depressions, uh, by, the, uh, by the lumps in the depressions on, on a surface. Molecules, you can think of them as feeling each other by looking for lumps in the holes. And this is a, a drug molecule, a penicillin derivative. And again, if you're not an organic chemist, it's not going to make much sense to you, but you can see that this part of the molecule has a different visual texture than this part of the molecule. Okay, this is the oily part, and this is the hydrophobic part, and this is the hydrophilic part. So you can tell just by looking at it that these, these parts of the molecule feel different, have different textures. And water can tell it as well. Water loves this part, water hates this part. And in the middle here, sort of in between, this is, the, this is, where, this is where this drug uh, kills bacteria. This is a sulfur atom. And there's a little green yarmulke, I call it. This, this is the active site right here. And it, that's, that's what is the death knell for, for bacteria. This tool, which we call Evolvis, again, it's able to find places, subatomic precision. So this is a platinum atom. This is a platinum atom, which was the main actor in the first chemotherapy drug uh, developed in the early 60s called, chemo, uh, called cisplatin. Cisplatin was originally used for testicular cancer. Now it's used for lung cancer. A host of cancers, but it works by um, these. These are ammonia molecules. They see there. You can't really tell, but these. Uh, this is yellow. This is yellow. This is green. Yellow is a lump. Green is a hole. So lumps fitting into the hole, and red is a, is um, a very very deep lump. You can see the platinum atom has very sharp grooves between these four banana kind of lumps. But this, this four this four pattern is. A chemist would recognize what that is. That's an empty d orbital. Uh, but the important point is that it has four bit holes, which are the green things you can see. And these yellow lumps are fitting into the holes. And what happens when you take this, these ammonias come off, and the nitrogens and guanines in your DNA, and also in cancer DNA, they click onto there. And they click onto the, the grooves, between the grooves, or into the grooves of platinum, and they don't let go. And so that stops that, that cell, that DNA molecule, from ever being duplicated. So that's essentially how this um, chemotherapy agent works. It kills our cells too, but hopefully it kills uh, more cancer cells than human cells. And it works because cancer cells divide rapidly, much more rapidly than our cells. So this works when cells are, this bites when cells are dividing. So hopefully it will, and it's worked so far, it's still being used 50 years later. Um, some chemists in Germany, want, uh, Switzerland rather, want to understand how uh, iron sulfur complexes in plants, actually not in plants, Plants have little um, um, fungi on their roots that help them make amino acids uh, out of the nitrogen in the air. That's how plants get nitrogen if a farmer doesn't throw fertilizer, fertilizer on it. But plants were able to get nitrogen before we had farmers. 
And they do that by having enzymes in fungi that are on the roots. And this is a chemical model of these enzymes. And in the middle here, you see there's um, a little, that's a, that's a nitrogen molecule from the air that's being reduced to, to amino acids. But it's being done by this chemistry. So we're trying to understand how these molecules, how these enzymes and, and fungi take nitrogen from the air and make amino acids that the plants can live on. So this is using the same tool. Again, red are the lumps and holes, and green and blues are, red are the lumps, and green and blues are the holes. So you can see lumps fitting into holes, as uh, Lemery said 350 years ago. Now, a lot of, um, if you take organic chemistry, your organic professor will play some videos showing you how one organic reaction works, the so-called reaction mechanism. Well, they usually show the, like, balls just moving around. But in all the videos, animations you'll see, the, the balls, they look like red, blue, green, black balls, but they just move. They, and they, might, have bond, they might have rods, bonds breaking, connect and break, break, but the balls themselves remain rigid, like Lego. When you, when you play with Lego, you take one piece from one place and put another place, the Lego brick itself does not change. All right? You just move it. And most of the animations of chemistry reactions are the same way. The atoms change places, but the atoms remain rigid, like billiard balls. And that they're, they're not. Atoms are definitely not billiard balls. So if we um, play this video, this is showing you, using my tool, our tool, how the, these, this is water splitting. That's two hydrogens and an oxygen. So you can see, remember the colors represent the texture. So you can see that as bonds break, atoms change their texture. They change their shape. So uh, it's very important to study how atoms change during a reaction if we truly want to understand the reaction. Uh, that's a simple, simple molecule. This is vitamin B12, much more complex molecule, but it's essential to life. Um, and this is, uh, so this was uh, proved that you don't have to be a chemist under, to appreciate this. This is the professor of art history. Martin Kemp, who just re retired a couple years ago, but in 2001 he was a professor in the chair of art history at Oxford. This is what he says about this tool. So um, it's sort of a, sort of a psychological um, impact. Um, and again, the place, getting back to place, the, this is a vitamin B12, different, lots of different places. There are some special places, though. Well, this is, you see there's, a blue, big blue ball there. That's the cobalt ion in the middle of in the middle of B12. All cobalt has all vitamin B12 has cobalt. There's another special place. It's coming around here, right here. This part right here. You see the four balls and the black ball in the middle. Okay, those four balls are oxygen atoms, and the black ball in the middle is a, pho is a phosphorus atom. That's a phosphate. You know, uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, DNA has a phosphate backbone. Phosphates are very important in biomolecules, large complex biomolecules that are necessary to move around. This, this enzyme react, the way it works in your body is, there, you can't really see it now, but this, there's, there's a phosphate that, that has a, there's a molecule connected to it, a group connected to it that's sticking up the bottom of the cobalt. That, that group falls, swings away. It's like a trap door swinging. And something else will come in and react with cobalt and fall out, and then the trap door comes back. So this is really a hinge. The phosphate acts as a, well, something has to be a hinge, because this group goes, swings, swings like a door. Uh, I've never seen a door that didn't have a hinge. But um, you can see this sort of looks like a hinge. You see, it's like these four balls around an inner ball. It's like a universal joint. So you can see how these could swivel past one another. Whereas everything else looks sort of like rods and sticks, branches, that can bend a little bit, but they can't really swing. So we didn't really realize what that, or at least I never read, read anybody explain what they thought the true role of phosphate is. I think the phosphate is actually a, a hinge for these molecules. Okay, finally, uh, the place where chemistry is studied is also important to the student and the teacher. This is not a medieval lab. <laughs> this is... This is the basement of Weiser Patent Science where we, we taught freshman chemistry for uh, 80 years. And it's, uh, it's a dungeon. We, you know, it really felt like a dungeon to the students and the professor. Um, of course, now we're in a brand new building. And if you Google um, MTSU 
on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and search MTSU Science Building, you'll see a lot of nice tours, and it really is beautiful. I don't, I don't want to leave time, but it's, plus you've probably already seen it, but it's really a very beautiful building, and it's inspired students and faculty to, well, um, I, it's, a, it's a thrill to go in. The Honors College is nice, but it's nicer to go into the Science Building. It's, it's a really, really nice uh, building. It's beautiful, but it also has cool instruments in it that uh, chemists like to see. And the students like it. I mean, students, you guys, I'm sure, I see some students studying upstairs in the, the study area. But I see all, there's all kinds of nooks and crannies where students can, can camp out and do homework for five or six hours. They, they, they find their favorite pl place. Because you know, you know, there's places that are far away from the faculty. And, uh, and students, they can write on the walls, uh, certain places. We have marker boards and markers right in the walls in the study areas. So students go there and they'll, 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 they'll stay there for hours doing homework. And I'd love to see that. Uh, yeah, they, the, the, students are the, the students are the humps and the, the nooks are the, are the holes. So yeah, finding lumps are finding holes. So, um, so th this is true everywhere in the world. So um, uh, I went to East Africa recently with some help from the Honors College and this is a, a little periodic tableau of elephants, I like to call it. So um, this is actually only half of, this, of the scene. I, I didn't have a wide angle lens camera, but you know, this is just a shot snapshot. There was, this is, let's say, 10 degrees, about 30 degrees of, of my vision, per, of, of the view, there were just elephants. I didn't count them, but there had to be 100 elephants, more than 100 elephants. And, the, and I never, you know, when you see herds of elephants, you might see six or seven. I did not realize. This is just out in the country. And this is actually Uganda. And I, this guy was, there's no fence. He was just, he was just across, there was a ditch. So the, the guide said he couldn't cross the ditch. So I felt safe. He said, you're safe here. And he, his trunk is up, he's smelling me. Uh, but again, this is, not a, this is not a telephoto lens. I was, I was as close to this guy as I am to Dean Vile. And uh, he was interested in me as I was interested in him. And uh, this is a village, a tiny village. There's a dirt floor. Um, and these are, this is a second grade class in Ajigo, Kenya. Um, it's right across the river from where Barack Obama's father was born, or if you believe other people that Barack Obama himself was born, but uh, it's right across the river. It's just across the river. It's less than a couple of miles from, from um, the, uh, and, and his father still has a, has a homestead there. It's dead, but it's interesting. Well, I'm not going to go into it, but when, when people die, their homesteads don't necessarily get t taken down. They believe their spirits still live there. It's, and ancestors are supposed to go back periodically. It's very interesting. Uh, and this is actually an elephant made by uh, an American high school chemistry class where they took an elephant and they made an elephant out of paper mache and they put, they made it, they made it, instead of periodic table of the elements, they said periodic table of the elephant. And they put, these are periodic table pictures. And so it inspired the American, this is a high school di class did this. It inspired, you can't see it right here, this is, the, the ACS made periodic tables that you can use. It has all the data, atomic numbers, atomic masses of the elements according to the way it was shown, the very first slide I showed you, which was wrong. Um, but and, and it has elephants. Like taking the, so the, the, the children in Kenya love these. I left them a whole stack of these periodic tables of the elephants. So the gold, the ele the, and, and the gold, the elements were a bunch of bling. Um, so every, every, every element has an elephant demonstrating some property of, of, that, of that element. So it's very interesting. And if you're pre-med, I met a, um, uh, a lead scientist at a uh, medical research institute in uh, Kisumu, which is very nice to have an, have an airport in Kisumu, right on Lake Victoria. So you don't have to go to Nairobi. Nairobi, well, you don't have to go to Nairobi. It's just a little bit of that. Um, you can fly right into Kisumu where this institute is, and they're looking for American pre-med students to do two-week internships. They'll pay for everything. So it uh, could be a very good opportunity. What you do there is you, you collect blood samples from children uh, to try and understand the genetic basis of some uh, bloodborne diseases such as malaria. And uh, I'm almost finished. So just summarizing what I did. And you did. So I want to leave some time for questions. So even though a question seems obvious, take time to think deeply about it. So uh, I'm glad I did. Um, and Harry Corbin, one of the advice he gave to all the students when he talked to MTSU is when you're in college, say yes. Like I said, yes to this seminar. 
Uh, say yes to a variety of opportunities that interest you. You'll never know what the results will be. It could be very interesting. And last, here we go. We have a few minutes. So few minutes. Yeah, we've got three or four. I was in Australia. That's uh, me in Australia. So I just um, there we go. Yeah, Bob has a question. Go ahead. You got to pop my balloon about Tang. Tell me it wasn't <laughs> wasn't invented in space. It was probably invented for space. I'm sure it wasn't invented in space. But if you do pop your balloon. Um, Remember, you're, all those helium atoms are lost forever. So uh, I'm actually signed petitions that you know limit the use of helium balloons. It's, um, uh, helium is actually a, a, a limited resource. If you ever had an MRI, the magnets that make that make it a useful tool are helium cooled and um, superconducting magnets. So we need the helium to cool the magnets to around around five degrees Kelvin. And so if you Helium is a limited resource, uh, so if you, if you pop a balloon or let a balloon go, it's gone forever. So if you, hydrogen is fun. It's light. It also explodes, so it's uh, <laughs> more fun at, at birthday parties. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you for coming.